a podcast. What is the word? A podcast by Kaluga. A podcast. No. By Kaluga. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Christy, host of Today We Tried, a parenting podcast from Kalugo. This season, we're talking all about the fourth trimester and beyond because we all know postpartum lasts more than 12 weeks. This week, I'm talking to Mallory Whitmore, also known as the Formula Mom, and it's truly an episode I wish I could have listened to six and a half years ago when I was a brand new mom of twins. I was so convinced that exclusive breastfeeding was the only good option, something that blew up for me within 12 hours of motherhood when my son, who had been growth restricted, needed formula supplementation. For those who have a choice, how you feed your baby can feel so fraught. We did a whole episode on this earlier in the season, but it really doesn't have to be, and recognizing that can be such an amazing step toward feeling empowered to make the best choices for you and your baby. Mallory and I chat about how she came to be the formula mom after suffering postpartum depression and struggling with breastfeeding with her first baby. She shares resources on how to have an awesome formula feeding journey, and I share what's worked best with my kids. She also shares why she loved her C-section, another reframe of the standard narrative that only vaginal births are quote, worthy or quote, good, which is absurd but somehow is a persistent and super damaging message. Okay, love this app. Let's jump in. So I am so excited to be here today with Mallory Whitmore, also known as the Formula Mom on Instagram. And I really wish that I had known Mallory and gotten her resources six years ago when I was a brand new mom. I was so stressed about exclusively breastfeeding my twins, which honestly lasted all of an hour because my son was taken to the NICU and he needed formula to supplement my milk to make it more caloric. You know, going forward, I just felt like I had no resources around formula feeding. It all felt very all or nothing. So very excited to be chatting with Mallory today about how we can reframe our thinking around formula, its benefits, and as she says on her website, how parents can feel less stress, more confidence, and no guilt while formula feeding. So thanks so much for being here, Mallory. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to chat today. Could we just start, could I hear a little bit more about what inspired you to start The Formula Mom? Absolutely. And I'll try to keep it short because I could talk about this forever. (laughs) So uh, we had our first almost six years ago, a daughter. And like most parents, I had assumed I would breastfeed. Not looking back, I'm not even sure that I wanted to breastfeed so much as it just felt like that was the obvious thing that I was supposed to do. That was quote unquote, what good moms did. So I was like, that's what I'll do. Cause I'm, you know, a rule follower by nature. For you, like when I went to the OB and everything, like that was the only thing they Mm -hmm. presented as an option too. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. There was never any discussion really about, are you going to breastfeed? It was just when you breastfeed, of course, you're going to breastfeed. And, you know, we went to both a labor class at the hospital and they only talked about breastfeeding and encouraged us to sign up for the breastfeeding class at the hospital, which we then did. So I thought I had it all figured out, right? As one does before you actually have a baby. (laughs) And, um, You know, just from the start, our feeding journey with her was really difficult. So she was early. She was 36 and a half weeks, uh, planned C-section because of a complication that I had. And she was just not really ready to be on the outside. She had a really weak suck. Uh, She needed oxygen support. So she was taken to the transitional nursery for about six hours. So we didn't have any of that like golden hour, you know, oh, snuggle first latch stuff. No, she was purple. She needed oxygen. Yeah, She was, she was elsewhere. So um, it was just really difficult. And my milk took forever to come in because I wasn't actually in labor. Yes. This is the... Okay. So we, I was induced with my twins and then they were both in the NICU Mm -hmm. and no one told, I was a first time mom. Mm -hmm. I had no idea it could take so long for your milk to come in. Mm -hmm. They were just like, oh, just start pumping, just start pumping. And I remember my husband would go with like literally a Q-tip worth of milk that I had managed to pump for days. Absolutely. Yeah. I remember the lactation consultant coming in and she would be like, well, you know, just squeeze a little bit and put that on your finger. And I'm like, lady, I I am squeezing and there was nothing. I don't know what to tell you. Um, And I do think, you know, I'm not 
a nurse. And so I don't know what medically is behind this, but I do think if you're induced or you have a plan C-section, you don't have those natural hormones that your body is saying, Hey, it's time for this baby to leave. It's time for you to make milk because the baby's leaving. It seems like it takes an extra couple of days for your body to get the memo. Like, Hey, we need to start. (laughs) So yeah, I had the same experience and she lost, our daughter lost 12% body weight by the third day. And finally a nurse came in and was like, we're not doing this anymore. We're not going to send you home with a sickly baby who's losing weight. We need to supplement with formula. And I was both relieved and also kind of horrified, right? Because I was like, I've only been a mom for three days and I'm already like failing at this. You know, I was supposed to breastfeed. We were supposed to, you know, I'm supposed to nurse, whatever. But I was so grateful that she was going to get some nutrition. And, um, we went home and she was just very unhappy and I was unhappy (laughs) trying to nurse and I switched to pumping and that was even worse for me. And she was still not gaining weight well. And it was just this drama going constantly to the pediatrician for weight checks. And I started developing pretty significant postpartum depression. And then around five weeks, my husband had an intervention as well as both my daughter's pediatrician and my doctor. And they were like, this is not working. You are not healthy. And I'm like, I know. And so we switched to full formula at six weeks when she was six weeks. I quickly realized I didn't have any knowledge about what to do. And I didn't, I couldn't find any information. All the information I could find on the internet about formula feeding was like, don't do it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I found myself in the formula aisle at 9 p.m. I had the six-week-old baby being like, what do I do now? What do I do? And so I created the formula mom to fill that gap, you know, spent the next couple of years and had my son and we formula fed him from the start, which was a really redemptive experience. So I spent the next couple of years researching and I worked at a formula company for about a year and I got certified as an infant feeding technician. And now I create all this content that I wish I had six years ago. That's incredible. And I was would love to hear more about the fast track formula finder that you have. Mm-hmm. Like, so how does that work? Yeah, absolutely. So what I found with my own personal experience and talking to um, followers and customers is that they need there needed to be a way to sort of cut through the noise in choosing a formula because you go in the aisle, there's 50 different options and they all have exciting claims like, you know, closest to breast milk and great for brain development and supports immunity. And you're like, what does this even mean? How do I understand what's actually going to work for my baby? And so I created the fast track formula finder as a quick way for parents to input their baby's needs, the symptoms that they're seeing in their baby, as well as their preferences. Because what is important to you in a formula matters just as much, in my opinion. You know, whether you want something that is accessible on the store shelves versus, you know, subscription mail order, whether you want something organic or something more cost-effective like generic, parents can input all that information. It takes about three minutes and then it populates a formula recommendation based on the information that parents provide. So it's just a really quick and easy way for parents to find some direction about what formula is going to make them feel good as well as work for their baby's needs. The first time around with Fritz and Lark, my twins, it was just, I was same as you like standing in the aisle and I was like, well, this one says organic on it. <laughs> yeah. So like, and oh it God. was at CVS, so yeah. I could uh-huh. get it. It's such a challenge to know. And like, I don't know how much to f- put in a bottle mm-hmm. with all my kids. Now I've like nursed and given them formula. Mm-hmm. We've done combo feeding, like kind of a mix. I call them like Frankenstein bottles. I don't I know, but yeah. we put it all together. It's all worked. Mm-hmm. I mean, the first time, like your story with your, your firstborn, like with my twins, I was really resistant to like giving formula. Mm -hmm. I was, so I would nurse my daughter, then I would pump. And then by then it was probably time to nurse my daughter Mm -hmm. again, because you're feeding them every two and a half, three Mm -hmm. hours. And I remember I finally gave my daughter just a bottle of formula because she was clearly hungry Mm -hmm. and I had no, I had no milk. (laughs) I know, I know lactation consultants will say like, you're never really empty. And I was like, definitely empty. There was no 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 milk. milk. (laughs) There was no milk. But I gave her a bottle of formula and I swear it was the first time she smiled and Mm -hmm. felt right asleep. Oh, I should be feeding my babies. My Mm -hmm. own feelings around nursing and formula should not mean that my baby doesn't have a full belly. Mm -hmm. And it was, yeah, it was a big learning moment for me. Yeah. That's an experience that a lot of moms have where you realize that your baby is finally satisfied and 
gosh, it's so, it's so many feelings, right? You feel relieved, you feel grateful, but then you also feel terrible about yourself because you didn't recognize that they were still hungry or you can't produce as much as they needed. On top of that, you're sleep deprived and hormonal and recovering from a major medical event. It's a lot, it's a lot to process. And so I always encourage parents, don't wait until you're in that spot to figure out the formula stuff because you don't have any brain cells for that at that point. You know, as much as we can try to encourage parents to get a little bit of formula education before birth, it's better to have it and not need it than to need it and not know where to get it or how. Even when I knew there was formula in the house, even if I'm nursing, I feel so much less pressure. I'm like, okay, if this isn't working, we can make a bottle. It's just there. Or if I need a break and my Mm -hmm. husband can feed the babies. That was another thing with twins is especially my son generally Mm -hmm. just took a bottle and it gave my husband a chance from day one to be feeding him too and to Mm -hmm. be part of that. And honestly, the connection when you're bottle feeding a baby, you can like Mm -hmm. look them in the eye in this different way, at least for me, Mm -hmm. like you really people undersell the connection you get Mm -hmm. when bottle feeding. It's so much focused on nursing Mm -hmm. as a way to connect, but either way, it's a great Mm -hmm. time to connect with your baby. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I end up talking with a lot of parents who are non-gestational parents, either Mm -hmm. dads or adoptive parents, foster parents, grandparents, same-sex parents, all sorts, you know, runs the full gamut. And the great majority of them obviously are not gonna be nursing, And we talk a lot about bonding and how there's absolutely a way to bond while you're bottle feeding. And for some folks, and I would include myself in this position as well, I was able to bond better with my baby while bottle feeding because number one, you have that different connection. You can look at your baby, you can study their features, you can rub their little head. You know, for me, that was really special, but also it just took the pressure off of me you have this dyad, right? I'm the food source, you are the eater. When you're bottle feeding, I got to be the mom instead of the food source, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And taking that pressure off allowed me to bond with my baby in a different way. For me, I felt like I wasn't even really able to start bonding until we started formula feeding. I know that's not the case for everybody, but for me, when we were nursing, It was like she would cry and instead of feeling attentive, I felt anxious and almost resentful. And that feels terrible to say, right? But it was so painful. It was so stressful. It was so fraught that until we switched to formula feeding, I couldn't enjoy feeding her. And all you're doing with a baby pretty much is feeding. And so, yeah, I mean, it was a big, a big important piece for our bonding, making that switch. When you're nursing exclusively to what also happens is whenever a baby is crying, people are like, Mm -hmm. oh, they must be hungry Mm -hmm. and like hand you the baby. And you're like, no, I just, it's not, you know, you, but you don't know maybe. And you're like, not sure. The other thing with bottle feeding for me, that's nice is you're like, okay, I know you just got a full Mm -hmm. meal. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're so hungry, but maybe you're just a little fussy and we need to walk around, but I don't, I'm not like wondering, like, did they get enough? I'm definitely that kind of like type A person oh, where it's same. like, okay, I can know you just had a full bottle. So now I feel more confident that I can walk you around and you just are a little bored or a little sleepy. And that's what we're doing. It's not like, okay, maybe I'll try nursing again. And I'm not sure what's happening. Yes, absolutely. That was a huge comfort for me, knowing how much my baby was getting, especially because she was slow to gain weight. But also it truly made me, I think, more in tuned to her needs and what were her hunger cues versus is she overtired? Is she overstimulated? Do we need to take a break? You know, what are my other soothing strategies I have in my arsenal? It really required me, I think, to view her more holistically, I guess, so that I could really assess what was the situation here and how do I fix it? Because it wasn't an option to just, you know, put her to the breast, like some folks might use as just sort of a default soothing strategy. Let's say either you know that breastfeeding isn't going to be an option for you, you know, same gay couple or you're adopting or other, you know, maybe based on your like Mallory and the first time around, you know, it didn't work. And so you're just feeling confident choosing formula first. What should you have at your house for when you get home or bring with you to the hospital? Because I know 
I gave birth at quote unquote, like baby friendly hospitals. Mm -hmm. Just if people haven't heard that term, they're kind of set up to encourage breastfeeding in a way Mm -hmm. that I feel is a little bit extreme in terms of you're not necessarily going to get, although maybe all hospitals would have some formula on hand, but they're, they're really set up to try to encourage breastfeeding. And so what should you have on hand going Mm -hmm. into it? If you think you're going to formula feed? Yeah, absolutely. And both of my births were at a baby baby friendly hospital as well. And it can be stressful. My hospital would not provide formula unless there was a medically indicated need. And of course they determine the medically indicated need. Me saying my mental health requires that I formula feed, you know, I believe that's a need was not sufficient for them. I have some families um, in my follower group where they had to sign waivers at the hospital before they would release formula to them, or they were rationing how much formula they would provide, which is again, so stressful if you just had a baby and you're trying to feed them. So I always encourage parents, if you think you might formula feed, or you know you're gonna formula feed, to bring your own ready to feed formula to the hospital. Again, it's one of those cases, it's better to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. So bring your own, and it has to be liquid ready to feed, that's sterile. Most hospitals will not allow you to bring in powder formula that young. So bring in your formula, bring in bottles, bring in dish soap. My hospital, I brought in my bottles and formula. I didn't bring dish soap and they gave me body wash. Oh like, no. You're not washing these bottles in body wash? So bring oh dish gosh. soap. Bring was it scented? It Did was. Have- oh yeah, it was very perfumey. And I was like, no. Oh. Um, bring in pacifiers. A lot of the baby friendly hospitals won't provide passies anymore because they're worried about nipple confusion. Obviously, if you're bottle feeding not much of an issue. Also, mm-hmm. I would just, this is a thing I feel fairly strong. I mean, mm-hmm. all babies are different, Yeah. but my, I snuck past fires in because mm-hmm. also I'm a rule follower and I would mm-hmm. like hide them in like the <laughs> inner pocket of my diaper bag. I don't know what I thought mm-hmm. they were going to like do to me. Yeah. But yes. Confiscate the passies. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know. I'm sure the way I understand nipple confusion also, and mm-hmm. you probably know much more about this than I do, but it's more of like a flow thing Mm -hmm. so that if you're breastfeeding, it can take a little more effort for your baby Mm -hmm. to get milk and it could be a little easier out of a bottle. So they might develop a preference, but if you go with a slow flow nipple, Mm -hmm. you're probably going to be in more equivalent and your baby is probably Mm going to what milk wherever they can get it. Your understanding is absolutely correct. So it has less to do with the actual nipple shape or the texture and more to do with the fact that it does take more effort to pull milk from a breast. And so of course, you know, humans by default are always looking for the path of least resistance. And so of course, if a baby can spend less energy for more milk more quickly, they're gonna choose a bottle. So choosing a slow flow nipple, using uh, what we call paste feeding strategies to help uh, reduce gravity, essentially, um, pulling the milk through the bottle nipple, all of those things can really help. Bring some, bring formula, Mm -hmm. bottles, dish soap, Mm -hmm. pacifier. Yes. And bring more than you think you will need. And um, just be prepared those first couple of days that the volume that your baby's going to drink is very small. You know, the smallest quantity that they make in ready to feed formula is two ounces. Most babies aren't going to drink two ounces until day three to five. So those first couple of days, just know you might be looking at, you know, half an ounce, 15 milliliters, maybe one ounce, 30 milliliters. And to, um, to try not to force your baby to finish a bottle, offer frequently at least every three hours, but pay attention to those hunger cues. And just know that there's a learning process with bottle feeding too. You know, it's a process of getting to know your baby, understanding what those cues are, making sure that you're not overfeeding because you want them to finish a bottle, things like that. When you did move to formula, Mm -hmm. you mentioned that that helped you feel like you were able to start bonding with Mm -hmm. your baby. Did that also kind of, was that enough there to move, to help manage your postpartum depression as well? Yes, it was definitely a big piece of the puzzle. So switching to formula made a difference in a couple of key ways. Number one, it meant that my husband could take some of the middle of the night feedings, which meant that I could get a consolidated stretch of sleep. And that was crucial in trying in that postpartum depression battle, getting, you know, four or five hours of consolidated sleep a night. He would do the first shift, I would do the second shift. It worked well for us. Number two, it meant that I could leave my baby for a decent period of time so that I could start therapy. 
you know, I could leave her for two hours, 30 minutes there, an hour session, 30 minutes back and not have to worry about if she could eat or if I had to pump during that time period. It also meant that I could take some time off to do some of the things that I knew were beneficial for my mental health, whether that was exercising or meeting up with a friend or going on a walk in the sunshine without worrying about do I need to pump? Do I need to feed her? Is she at home crying because she's hungry? Things like that. And then I also did start medication and was able to really look at a wide range of medications because I wasn't worried about whether it was breastfeeding safe, essentially. And so the combination of switching to formula, sleeping, getting on medication and doing therapy, all of those things were really helpful in me overcoming the postpartum depression. And pretty much all of them were tied into that decision to formula feed because it allowed me the time and the space and the ability to do those other things that I needed. That's wonderful. And I think that's really wise also to like, to think about the full kind of spectrum of things you need to do and maybe reconnecting to things that were meaningful to you before you had a baby, like exercise, like having that time to yourself talking things out. I really think the partnership aspect of it too, like having someone else be responsible for the baby's meals, like that, that's how Ted and I did. We like divided up the nights. And since then with other babies, I, that's been my first bottle has always been to move to a bottle at that like bedtime time. Cause that's when my brain is, I just need to go to sleep. So like I can go to sleep probably any time in my life, but especially right after having a baby at like 8.30. So like I would go to bed, Ted would be responsible for that bedtime bottle, getting them down such as it is to bedtime with a newborn. And then I would get up at the like, you know, 2 a.m. and do two to six. But at that point I felt so refreshed. It's amazing how refreshed you can feel after like four hours of sleep when you- Yeah, <laughs> when just you having that sleep that's consolidated versus, you know, sometimes I would be like, I mean, I bet I probably got six and a half hours, but then I look back and it's like, okay, I had 45 minutes here. I had an hour and 15 minutes there. I was up for an hour and a half because there was a giant spit up and you're like, I, I maybe got six hours of sleep, but it was so sort of piecemeal that it, none of it was restorative sleep. None of it was like REM deep sleep. So yeah, that was really crucial for us. So did you feel then heading into having baby number two, mm -hmm. were you then like totally confident in starting with formula feeding or like what did that coming to that decision feel mm -hmm. like for you? Yeah, absolutely. So truthfully, my experience with our first daughter was so difficult that for a very long time, I thought maybe she would be, we would be one and done because I just could not imagine going back and living that sort of postpartum experience again. And in talking with my husband about whether to have another baby, the formula feeding piece became sort of like an ultimatum where it was like, I truly can only consider living through postpartum again if we take the breastfeeding pressure and drama off the table. And, um, you know, maybe that sounds a little extreme, but for me, it was the only thing that I could think of that could get me to a place where I could consider trying again. And so we made that decision that that was a worthwhile trade. And I just felt so much peace about it. I felt so much peace about it. And my postpartum experience was totally different with him. I didn't have postpartum depression and it just felt so much more controllable for me. Just being able to take one piece of the equation saying, this is what we're going to do. I know this works for me. I know this is going to allow me to have those other pieces in my life lined up that are going to be good for supporting my mental health. And also I was formula fed and I feel like I turned out great and formula is way better now than it was 35 years ago. And so, um, I think a lot of the work that I had done between my first and second child really allowed me to go into that second postpartum experience feeling not only confident about formula, but grateful that it existed, that it was an option, that it was nutrient dense and healthy and that it would allow him to thrive and allow me to thrive in the way that we needed. So you have that mindset mm -hmm. well earned and like well thought out and you're feeling confident. How did you or how do you talk to people in your community who are getting mm -hmm. pushback from family members, maybe don't have a partner who is on board mm -hmm. and there for them in that way, who only read like breast is best and, and they're seeing all these incoming messages. I feel like social media, even mm -hmm. based on even six years ago and now, like yeah. 
it's so much more ubiquitous. You're getting all these messages. Mm -hmm. What advice do you have for kind of staying confident or like pushing back or responding? Because like no one should Mm -hmm. have to justify their feeding decisions, but that is the world we're in. Absolutely. It is really tricky and it's really hard for a lot of folks. The first thing that I encourage parents to do is to spend some time really looking at what high quality research says about breastfeeding outcomes and formula feeding outcomes. One of my favorite resources is the book Crib Sheet by Emily Oster. She's an an economist and professor, and she looked at all of the high quality research for a bunch of different fraught parenting topics. So she looks at sleep training versus not, she looks at baby led weaning versus purees, and she looks at breastfeeding versus formula feeding. And it's a great way to really understand what the research actually says, which generally shows that the long-term and short-term outcomes are not super significant. Related to that, I love to encourage folks to pay attention to how statistics are presented because a lot of the times statistics will reference relative risk and not absolute risk. So you'll see statistics that are like formula fed infants are twice as likely to get an ear infection. And you're like twice as likely two times, like that sounds horrible. But what the research doesn't or excuse me, what the statistics don't tell you is that that's relative risk. So the absolute risk has gone from 2% to 4%. So there's a 96% chance your baby's not going to get an ear infection no matter what they eat. So yes, that sounds scary. Oh, twice as likely, but no one tells you that that's 2% to 4%. Your absolute risk still remains very, very low. So just helping encourage parents to really piece apart, like what is this messaging that I'm getting? What does it look like in context? And then number two, and this is difficult, but it's necessary, is reminding parents that this is just one of a long line of decisions they're going to have to make for their baby that folks might not agree with. As much as we wish that it ended with the formula and breastfeeding debate, it does not. It just (laughs) continues. It continues and continues and continues. And so learning how to flex that muscle now of saying, this is what's best for my baby. This is what's best for my family. I appreciate your information, but it's not for me. Great for you, not for me, is going to serve you so well as your child gets older and these debates and shame-filled, you should, you shouldn't, continues just having that resource under your belt of saying, I know how to say no, is going to benefit you later. So even if you're not sure you can do this now, try to do it now because it's going to benefit you later. I think recognizing when I had a reaction to someone else's parenting Mm -hmm. choice that had nothing to do with me and was going to have no impact on me or my family. It's like, Mm -hmm. why am I feeling that way? And it Mm -hmm. usually is because like everyone else, I want people to do what I'm doing so Mm -hmm. I can feel validated in my choices, right? It's like, oh, but if you're not doing that, it can feel threatening. And so I think when you do have someone who's reacting to like the fact that you're formula feeding your baby, it's like, okay, that probably has more to do with Mm -hmm. them than with you. Oh, absolutely. And so it's hard to remember, but just like recognizing that people have a lot of their own stuff going on. And so Mm -hmm. trying to just let that ride and feel confident in what you're choosing is so important there. You know, something I, Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe I read this on your page mm-hmm. about the ear infection thing too, mm-hmm. is like, that might also just be based on kind of what you had talked about with like paste feeding. Mm-hmm. And like, yeah. it might just be a function of like how you're feeding your baby yeah. with formula in a bottle and just like mm-hmm. the, if, and wanting to like slow that down than really absolutely. kind of actually being related to like yeah. formula or not. Yeah, absolutely. It's largely related to if milk is pooling in the back of the throat you know, it's so close, especially babies are so little, so close to that ear canal that I forget what it's called, but that ear tube, um, that if milk is pooling, either because your baby is, you know, horizontal while feeding, or if you prop a bottle, or if you have a bottle in their crib that they're, you know, sucking on all night while they're laying flat, 
that milk pools. And so absolutely, I think that's one of the most frustrating things for me about some of the research related to formula outcomes is there's just a lot of confounding factors and it's not ethical to run, you know, a double blind randomized control trial because you can't force half the people to breastfeed and half the people to formula feed. And so our research relies on people who opt into one or the other. And we know that people who opt in tend to be different, pretty substantially different from one another. Folks who breastfeed tend to have salary jobs, tend to have maternity leave, tend to have access, um, higher income, tend to have access to better, better medical care, things like lactation, support, um, generally tend to have more uh, advanced degrees. And so it's hard to separate some of those confounding factors from what's actually the breast milk versus mm -hmm. what's sort of a characteristic of parents that tend to breastfeed. It's really tricky to piece out. And, you know, like you said, with the the ear infections, is it actually the formula or is it something about the bottle feeding experience? It's tricky. I would often kind of blame whatever fussiness was going on with my kids, like whether it was, I was at a point where I was exclusively breastfeeding mm -hmm. them or whether they were getting some bottles. I was like always blaming the milk or mm -hmm. the formula on the fussiness, mm -hmm. especially that like six week period where they're like, mm -hmm. things are, can go a little nuts. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's like a lot of fussiness, there's, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but, and, and kind of feeling this urge to like either cut things out of my diet mm -hmm. or like buy a different formula or all of this. Is that something you see too from parents and like, oh, how yeah. do you suggest like managing through that desire mm -hmm. to be like, oh, I'll just pick up another different formula or like yes. another thing and change mm -hmm. things up. Yeah. That is a super, super common experience that you have. And I think that happens largely because switching the formula or removing something from your diet feels like a very easy, tangible way to make a change. And of course, it would be so easy if that's all it took, right? It'd be so easy to just be like, we'll try a new formula and then they'll be better. What ends up happening, and this happened with my daughter our first as well, is you end up making things worse. Because if you're switching formulas every three days for three weeks, then it's really hard to tell what's actually a a formula related symptom and what's just my baby's digestive system freaking out, right? Because we as adults eat tons, tons of different foods every day. Babies have had one food, maybe two. If you're introducing a bunch of new ingredients a lot, the digestive system can tend to be like, what's going on? And you'll see an increase in things like gas and reflux and constipation and fussiness. So I always encourage folks, try all of your other strategies before you switch formulas. So unless there's symptoms of an allergy, right? If you have widespread red rash, eczema, hives, blood in the stool, absolutely switch. switch. Talk to your doctor, they'll help you switch. But if your baby's just fussy, try your other strategies first. Make sure that they're not overtired. Follow your wake windows. Try offering gripe water or gas drops, maybe a probiotic supplement. Make sure that you're burping effectively. Do your baby massage and your bicycle legs to help them move that gas out. Change how your uh, what your feeding technique looks like that, to make sure they're not getting so much gas in. Have your doctor look or your child's doctor look and see if the latch is appropriate, if there's any oral ties that may be causing them to get too much air in while they're feeding. There's a ton of different strategies that I would recommend first because sometimes switching the formula just makes things worse. And then you have the same issues and a new issue on top of that right. related to the formula switching. And do you have like a go-to bottle as like a first bottle to try mm -hmm. that you feel like is most works mm -hmm. for most babies to start out with. Cause I remember having a lot of trouble deciding yes. which bottle to get. Yes. And the bottle thing is like the formula thing where you can, there's a million different brands and they all claim different things. And you're like, Oh, what do I choose? So I love Dr. Brown's, the narrow neck bottles, although they do have a lot of parts to clean and we use them. I recognize that is not great. <laughs> so um, what we like about those is they have a, a narrow sloped nipple, that is gently sloped. So the bottom, the base is bigger than the top. Um, and they have the venting system, which is great for babies with gas or colic. 
The Even Flow Feeding Balance Plus bottle is also a really great option. It has another gently sloped nipple. It comes in both narrow neck and wide neck, and it has a vent built into the nipple. So it only has three pieces, just the nipple, the collar, and the bottle, but it does have a venting system built in. So less to clean, but functions sort of the same way. Having been in this world, gotten training, talking to all these parents over the last six years, do you feel as though things are changing or getting better, getting worse in terms of kind of the way we're thinking about formula, the options out there? I feel like I've become more confident personally in like supplementing with formula for my kids, mm -hmm. but I feel like that might be just the move from like first time mom to mm -hmm. going through it three times. So mm -hmm. would love to hear your perspective on like what you're seeing generally. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, my perspective is also subjective and a little bit biased based on the work that I've been doing and, you know, just me growing as a mom for five and a half years. I think on the one hand, things are getting better in that we're seeing a lot of formula innovation in the last year and a half. So we've had two new formula brands um, that have started that are really shaking up some of the traditional recipes and increasing the quality of formula of options that are available. And they're also really active on social media and trying to do a lot of those sort of stigma shaking pieces from their end. So yes, I think the formula market is improving. I don't think that formula stigma in general is improving much. I think in fact, what we've seen in the last two years, especially aligned with the pandemic is this push for a lot of families toward mistrust of regulatory agencies and increased desire for natural options, a firmer dichotomy between parents who might call themselves like natural or gentle parents and parents who might call themselves like science forward or, you know, whatever you want to call it. And so there seems to me to be increased stigma as those two groups have become more vocal on social mm -hmm. media. And so, and I'm not saying one is better than the other. They, it is what it is. But um, in that way, I think a lot of formula feeding parents are feeling more stigma than ever um, as the sort of natural crunchy mom movement seems to have gotten more vocal. If that makes sense. That makes sense. I mean, I've certainly seen that around uh, we're recording around a time of where there have been formula recalls and shortages. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I feel like what I'm seeing on like mom TikTok is mm -hmm. I've been like pretty shocked by the reaction mm -hmm. of, I, I know it's probably a small group, but it just seems mm -hmm. so big when you're in like the TikTok algorithm yeah. of, of parents who are exclusively breastfeeding kind of being like, mm -hmm. ha ha, like not a problem for me. Like, yeah. and I was just, shocking to mm -hmm. me. Again, this goes back to like what we were talking about in terms of needing choices to be validated, exclusively nursing your baby. Like that takes a lot of work, but oh so, gosh, and so yeah. does, mm -hmm. but so does all choice. Like, so mm -hmm. does formula feeding your baby. I don't know. I, it's a little hard for me to kind yeah. of get into the headspace where you would think that that you would be shaming other mm -hmm. moms for their choices, but so that really, I think around the recall, there was this kind of, mm -hmm. the reaction has been surprising to me, not as empathetic yes. and uh, as I would have hoped. Right. Yeah. It has been really tricky. And I think you're absolutely right to bring up TikTok, which is the wild west of social yeah. media. Very unfiltered. There can definitely be a lack of em empathy there. I have also been disheartened by some of the reactions to the recall and the formula shortages from the breastfeeding community, because I know for me, shame and judgment has never worked for me to change my behavior. And also by the time a family is formula feeding, the breastfeeding ship has basically sailed, right? So for some in the breastfeeding community to come out and be like, sucks to be you, this is why you should breastfeed it's too, it's too late, right? Like even if you were to try to induce lactation, that process takes weeks, months. It's not going to help if you can't find your formula tomorrow. And so 
it's been tricky to navigate for me, um, trying to honor the fact that absolutely this is a peril associated with formula feeding. Certainly no one expected it, but this is the reality. While also um, recognizing that sh creating shame about that doesn't help the situation. That, you know, it doesn't, doesn't solve anything for parents that are facing it today. I mean, a lot of the factors that you talked about in terms of people who choose to breastfeed versus mm -hmm. choose to formula feed, a lot of that comes from a lot of privilege. Like Absolutely. I know for me, it's been much easier to nurse my baby mm -hmm. this time around because I've been home mm -hmm. and working from home. So yeah. when she needs to nurse, like I'm mm -hmm. right here and I have a partner and mm -hmm. I have a ton of other resources that have made that mm -hmm. possible. And even there, like for me, what works best is combo feeding yeah. too. Mm -hmm. So to assume that everyone, and maybe you are a non-gestational parent and mm -hmm. it wasn't a choice like from day one. Yeah. And so I just think, yeah, I mean, it's like so much in parenting, like not assuming mm -hmm. that everyone can make your same choices and has your mm -hmm. same set of options mm -hmm. is just a really important thing to learn. And it can be so hard in this context as you said, what you're doing with your baby when they're first born in those first early days yeah. is feeding them mm -hmm. or hopefully they're sleeping or you're changing their diaper. Mm -hmm. And so it's such a huge part yeah. of your relationship in those early months. And then over time, it just becomes like a smaller mm -hmm. and smaller part. And there's other things that right. take that place. Yeah. And I would add, and you know, it's tricky. I absolutely agree. Breastfeeding intersects with privilege in a really tricky way. And I never want folks to feel like I'm saying, oh, it's easy to breastfeed. It is not. It is not. But that there are some advantages that make breastfeeding easier for some folks than others. I think the current statistic is that 25% of moms in the U.S. go back to work within two weeks of birth. Two weeks. I mean, there's no way to even regulate your milk supply at two weeks, especially if your milk doesn't come in for five days like right. it was for me, you know. Yeah. And then a lot of folks don't realize that while most employers have to provide protected time to pump. If you're an hourly worker, that time isn't paid. And so if you're having to take, let's say an hour out of your day to pump for 20 minutes, three times a day, right? That adds up. If you're an hourly worker and you're missing, let's say $7 a day, you know, an hour a day times 30 days, or I guess you're only working, you know, five days of the week, whatever that's going to be a ton of lost income, especially if you qualify for free formula through WIC or some sort of supplemental assistance program. And so these are the choices parents are having to make. Like, would they love to breastfeed? Yes. Financially, can they afford to breastfeed? A lot of them can't. Mm -hmm. And so it, it drives me crazy when sometimes we'll see this sort of mom blaming and shaming, where really there's much bigger societal issues that need to be addressed before we can truly ask or require or expect moms to breastfeed for a year. There, mm -hmm. It's just not feasible for a lot of folks. And it's never even just an hour. If you're trying to pump three no. times a day for 20 minutes, you also have to like get yourself mm -hmm. somewhere, store the milk, like that's yep. wash easily all wash all the pump yeah. parts. Like you could easily mm -hmm. be losing an hour and a half, two yeah. hours. Yeah. Also, these are the same parents who are commuting to the job mm -hmm. they need to yep. get to like it's this whole societal apparatus not set up to support mm -hmm. breastfeeding but then yeah. who gets blamed for not breastfeeding yeah. the mom absolutely absolutely right. yeah all right well before i lose you i just want to mm -hmm. touch briefly on you wrote a scary mommy mm -hmm. article that i love about mm -hmm. why you loved your c-sections and yeah. i think this is like just like you're reframing conversations mm -hmm. around formula and why formula can be the best choice mm -hmm. and so nourishing and great for your baby c-sections mm -hmm. can be the best choice and mm -hmm. not be something that parents should feel any sort of shame around right. and would just love to hear kind of what advice you would give to maybe a new mom who mm -hmm. maybe unexpectedly had a C-section, mm -hmm. it wasn't their plan. What would you share with them as they're kind of mm -hmm. recovering for the first time from that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first, let me say I had two planned C-sections. So okay. my first was planned due to a placenta complication. My second was planned just as a repeat 
plain C-section because I was I had a good experience the first time. So I was like, I know what we're doing. Let's let's do it. Yeah. Um, and also I'm risk averse and the thought of, you know, putting myself at risk for a, uh, a uterine rupture, however low the, the probability, I was like, I just don't think we want to do that. Um, so I'll say up front that having a planned C-section is a totally different experience than like being in labor for 40 hours, being exhausted, not eating. And then you go into an emergency C-section, you don't remember any of it and you know, all of that. I can't speak to that. I know that a lot of folks end up with negative feelings around their C-sections with that sort of scenario. For me, I knew starting at 20 weeks that a C-section was likely. I knew by 30 weeks that it was definite. And so I, with this was with my first daughter. And so I had a lot of time to prepare and wrap my mind around the fact that this was how things were going to unfold. All that to say though, I really grew to appreciate some of the benefits that a C-section offers. And this is, again, like with the formula feeding, not to say that there aren't detriments and not to say that there aren't benefits to having a vaginal delivery. But for me, it was helpful to also recognize there are benefits to these things that are, you know, that society sort of thinks are second best. There are benefits generally, and there are benefits to me. And so really recognizing this is a great opportunity for my husband to bond with our baby because I'm not going to be able to get off of this couch for a couple of days. And I definitely cannot pick up our toddler <laughs> for the, yeah. you know, for the next six weeks or whatever, recognizing that like, that was a benefit for us that he had to step in earlier. Um, you know, it was a benefit for me that I could still see him being born. We did a clear drape with my son, which I loved. And I'm like the biggest fan of, and I, I'm not like the most, I'm, I can be kind of squeamish and I still, I thought it was amazing. Is that like standard so far as you no. know, or is it like, do you need to, I had to request how you make it. that happen. Okay. Yes, I had you to would request make a request. It. Um, and it was amazing. And I would do it again in a heartbeat. I loved, and this is like so weird to say, but I loved having a catheter in for 24 hours. Like I loved that after I had this baby, I didn't have to like drag my booty up to go to the bathroom 12 times a day, especially after, you know, just being pregnant and having to pee all the time. Mm -hmm. um, like that was a benefit and it was not painful to put in. It was not painful to come out if folks have that concern. So there are benefits. I know that that is not everybody's preferred method of giving birth, but for me, it was a good experience. I would do it again. And um, yeah, it it feels to me just as valid as any other method of giving birth. So that's sort of my stance on it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think for me, the C-section, like the my fear around a C-section was mm -hmm. the recovery from it. Mm -hmm. And it seems like if you can think about it as giving yourself permission to then mm -hmm. recognizing it as a major surgery right. so that you then are like, I need to heal from this mm -hmm. major surgery. And like taking that time is really mm -hmm. important. There's so many things that happen and whether it's planned, but maybe it's planned because you had a complication. And so it was not your mm -hmm. first choice, mm -hmm. like being able to reframe that and finding the good parts and mm -hmm. recognizing the challenges there's just always so much more nuance to all mm -hmm. these things that happen in life and as parents mm -hmm. that it's yeah. important to recognize. Yeah, absolutely. And I would add too that I absolutely know folks that had a vaginal delivery who had a worse recovery than I did. And so I think sometimes we fall into this dichotomy mm -hmm. of like a vaginal delivery means easy recovery and a C-section delivery means horrible, really dramatic recovery. And certainly an ideal vaginal delivery with no tearing might absolutely be easier than a dramatic C-section, but you just never know what you're going to get either way. And so I think, you know, preparing that you are going to need extra assistance. You're going to want to lay low. You're going to want to have help no matter what is a good place to start. Yeah. That's great advice and really good to think about no matter what mm -hmm. and how you get that support in place. And I feel like it's one way also to think of formula in this, like, mm -hmm. if you are in a position where you're like, you're choosing or you could do both or whatever, like formula I, for me has always just felt like it's like one more thing supporting me. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think it's a great option and, and mm -hmm. really I'm just... So I have learned so much by following along oh, on your Instagram. Super. So would just highly recommend everyone follow. Mm -hmm. It's at the Formula Mom. Yep. And it's just really empowering, like 
witty educational content. So like, okay. yeah, no matter okay. where you are, I feel like it's <laughs> like we talked about today, like even if you're past the point of mm -hmm. formula feeding, like so many parenting choices are so similar to mm -hmm. this. And so just th what you talk about in terms of feeling empowered in your choices mm -hmm. is something you have to remember over and over again in parenting. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here today, Mallory. I really appreciate it. It's been great to chat. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Today We Tried is brought to you by Kalugo, a baby gear brand founded by parents for parents. I'm your host, Christy, and our producer is Mike Pilak. Stay tuned for more. And in the meantime, remember, you got this and we've got you.